<laughs> so, um, <laughs> last time we spoke a lot about uh, karma, which has been quite interesting. I mean, we, uh, you have also asked many important and interesting questions with regard to that. We also uh, gradually we will now come on, come with the topic of uh, uh, previous lives. And when we learn about previous lives, we will also be able to, to explore mm -hmm. next lives. Or in other words, the most controversial topic of the afterlife. Mm -hmm. There's actually an even more controversial topic, but I'll just get to that later. Let's just tackle one at a time. <laughs> But this is um, um, actually, it's interesting that uh, many of these topics have been, uh, especially when it comes to reincarnation or what we call in Buddhism, rebirth. It's been, it's been a topic that uh, a lot of people are becoming more interested in last, uh, in recent years, especially since the, since I think from the 80, late, late 80s and beginning of the 90s, we have had a uh, much more better systems of resuscitation and uh, a lot of people are starting to experience near-death experiences or what they sometimes call NDEs and uh, that that kind of experiences and also the fact that a lot of research is being done by about children who can remember their previous lives all of that together has created quite some um, uh, interest among the public in um, what it means if we have uh, previous and also next lives. But let's go back to where we were first and maybe we can get a little further. <laughs> but it's interesting to have these discussions and these questions uh, because uh, sometimes uh, when I talk and I don't know if you, if you can connect with it then I don't get anywhere. So it's, it's very good <laughs> to hear that you um you can you can connect or you can you know you can you can somehow uh, relate to it or, or not and then we can talk about that so lumpy the audience our audience is i feel like we're pretty quasi advanced like we like topics that are harder to <laughs> not yeah. basic we're, we're pretty the, this group is pretty basic uh, advanced at this level like right right so the karma is perfect <laughs> Everyone's into the karma. Good, good. So last and time we, um, we actually, uh, oh, this one is the wrong one. Last time we, uh, we actually were, were uh, uh, left with uh, karma. And this is uh, the next presentation, how karma works. I'm going to, can you see this already? No. No, not yet. Okay. Is the statue behind you open in your office or is it just going in right now? Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Oh, we talked about, um, this is already about two or three months ago. We talked about moral reasoning in uh, psychology, which is very similar to what we, what we refer to in Buddhism as right view, which is a, a, your ability to reason come up with solutions when you have to make moral decisions about your work, what kind of work do you choose, what kind of people do you associate with, what kind of things would you do in your life and what kind of things would you absolutely not do, you know. This is uh, in psychology they call this the four component model of morality, moral sensitivity, judgment, motivation and character. All of these are in Buddhism are called right view. And this is in, in Pali language, in the ancient Indian language. And uh, I remember you telling me that uh, it's also a word in Sanskrit. In Pali language, yeah. it's samaditi, which means right view. View is diti, or, which is literally means that which you see. And samma is also the same word that we use in meditation, samma alahang. Samma is right or perfect. Ten forms of right view are things that the Buddha often would mention as the sort of things that would help us in our lives to come to a more realistic and also more motivated way of leading our lives. 
So the first four as are as um, uh, broken down by our uh, deputy abbot, Lompot Atta Kibo, or Lompot Atta. He's a very good teacher. He's broken it up into two parts. The first four are what we call the principles to leading one's life happily. And the last six are the facts of life. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, Lompot Atta's style. He's like very fact and, you know, very, his language is always very strong. But the first four are about principles to lead one's life happily. And we already talked about some of those. Um, we talked about giving, how important it is to give in our life. We can have a good family life only if we have giving. We can have, um, we can have uh, even in competition in, in, um, in our business life, if we always try to compete with each other, try to 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 find all sorts of ways to get the other person from the market, then you never find uh, happiness in life. And uh, even in business life that holds. <clears throat> then there is sacrifice means that we all need to help each other out. Even those that we don't know, people we don't know. Sometimes we need to help each other out. Sometimes we need to have sacrifice. Sacrifice in the time of the Buddha meant that you Honor that you maybe uh, killed a goat or killed an animal in honor of the gods, but the Buddha, he then told uh, the people who did this kind of ceremonies, he said, there is a better sacrifice, which is the sacrifice of helping those in need. And um, then there is offering. There is offering means um, that you are, think it's important to honor people who are worthy of respect. So this is uh, slightly, in the West, we would think of such a thing as a more conservative way of looking at life. Uh, the, whereas the first two are generally in the West associated with a more liberal perspective that you need to help other people. But actually, um, apart from politics, there is also the, simply the question, how, what is life like? What are the facts of life? What is, what is the reality of life? And the reality is that we all need inspiration, need encouragement. And uh, when we have more inspiration and encouragement, we find it easy to do good. So we all need heroes. This is, or you wanna, you could say heroines. We also need women who are heroes. So, very important thing, for example, in our temple is that Kunyai, the nun who founded our temple, was uh, in many ways an example for many of the women who come to our temple. And then there is Lompata Machio and Lompata Takivo. They are both examples in different aspects of the spiritual life. When you have an example to live your life by, whether it's someone in Buddhism or somebody else, then you feel inspired to find more to to do more good in life normally we we all have um, certain levels certain standards of what we like to live by what we like to strive for but when you have somebody who you know who's an example in something then it's much easier to visualize the standards for which after which you strive uh, after which you the standards you're trying to achieve so that's why it's so good to have examples in life but there is offering or there is, uh, it's important to respect people who are worthy of respect. It's not only about people who have a position. It's also about people who simply have very good qualities uh, of mind. People around you could be examples in, in certain uh, in good qualities of, of that uh, are important in life. So the last one is actually about karma. These, there are fruits and results of good and bad actions. And then we, we, we were talking about that. Now, some of these topics there actually very much have to do with the question is, is uh, when we study about philosophy in life or religion, is it supposed to make us afraid? Because when we learn about uh, rebirth or afterlife in Buddhism, then there may be this question, is it, 
Is it sometimes something that should make us afraid or something like that? Well, there is some truth to that in the sense that there, in, in Buddhism, we do say that sometimes when you are aware that your actions have consequences and you're more careful of that, then that is actually, you could say that's a sort of fear, but it's a fear of, of not being careful. But then on the other hand, if we are, our entire life is permeated by fear, then that's not a good thing. And then there is the other thing that when we have right view, we are not only more careful, but we also have more courage to do good. I think, uh, B, you are a good example of that. You have a very courageous person to do good in all sorts of circumstances. And that is actually uh, an example. Uh, many of you are an example in that because sometimes life doesn't give us easy choices, you know. When we want to do good, it's not always uh, easy or the people around us do not always agree with that. And sometimes there's a lot of cynicism in society. And the courage to do, do, to do good is just the opposite of that, going against the stream going against the tendency of society to always be cynical. So there's four or five aspects in the courage to do good. The first one is faith, and that is actually where right view comes in. Right view and faith are very closely related. And faith is actually about the basic understanding and, and belief that all the good things we do have good effects. Even if we do not actually um, are not able to, to come to a very clear conclusion that it's always like that because we haven't seen it all, we still believe it. That is what we call faith in Buddhism. Faith in Buddhism doesn't always have to connect with a person. It can also be about the nature of life. So we might have faith in the Buddha, that, that is also exists in Buddhism, but faith is also, and perhaps even more importantly, about your actions and how your actions will have good consequences. In other words, um, all the things we do matter. Hmm. But some teachers, they, they just, they, they, they formulate it more, more negatively. They say simply, the law of karma is that you cannot get away with anything. <laughs> but that, that's actually very negatively f phrased. And uh, you could actually say the law of karma is also very important in terms of having the courage to do good. Okay, so the principles of karma, we talked about this about a month ago. Karma will always ripen for the doer, um, for the actor, for the person who does the deed. Uh, so whenever you do something good, like for example, you gossip about your, your, your colleague, your coworker, and then at a certain point, that karma is going to go, come back to you. You cannot just say, well, um, maybe somebody else can take my, can take the fall or something like that. You cannot, you cannot do that because karma will always come back to the doer, the person who acted in the first place. And then a karma that has been done will always ripen as soon as it obtains an opportunity to ripen. It will not always, this, this, okay, there's this term in English, instant karma. And that, that actually exists. It can happen sometimes. In, 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 in Dutch, we say uh, sometimes God punishes immediately. <laughs> but that's actually a different idea. But it's, it's, it's a similar thing in the sense that sometimes we see things happen. And then suddenly some consequence happens straight away. You know? these are, there are these, uh, these very scary YouTube videos of people who've been acting uh, very they've done a lot of wrong things in traffic and then they immediately get <laughs> somebody crashes into them or something, these instant karma videos. But actually life is not always like that. Sometimes the people who we see doing a lot of hurt, doing a lot of harm, they don't seem to, they seem to be able to get away with it. And why is that? Because there is an opportunity. There hasn't been an opportunity yet for that karma to ripen. And the same way, sometimes we do a lot of good, but it doesn't always immediately show its effects. That is also uh, the same principle. There must be an opportunity. Sometimes 
there is old karma which is in the way, which is obstructing the new karma from arising. So we need to be patient as well sometimes when we do good. But then there is the question uh, that we also discussed about two months ago. Should it even be important to have karma, uh, to, to be able to know that karma always ripens, that good deeds always have a good effect? Is that it, should it even be, imp be important? And then I, I, I would like to go back to the idea of faith. The idea of faith is not, not only that we will get a reward, but it's also that there is an inherent, um, can you still see this? Sorry. No. All right, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. So, um, uh, faith is not only about, about, about being, being able to get a reward when you do something good, like a kid wants to have ice cream when he's done his homework, but uh, it's also about having a strong belief that there is an inherent goodness in certain actions, that these actions are inherently good and that they will always attract good things in life, that these two naturally go together always. And uh, the same holds for doing something wrong. Once you connect with anger, with greed and delusion in your life, then there's no way that's going to end up right, that's not going to end up well. There will always be consequences. And that, so that's, it's, not only a, it's not so much about uh, giving ice cream to a kid that does his homework, but it's more about the very nature of goodness itself. So karma gives us courage. It doesn't only give us cautiousness, to be cautious, but also gives us courage. Because we will know that it always, once it has an opportunity, the nature, very nature of goodness is that it attracts good things in our lives. So we will not have to uh, find, wait for people around us to give us encouragement, because we will know that the very nature of goodness itself is that it will attract good things. Even if no one around us is there to give us approval, we, no one even knows that we do something good, then we will still do it because we believe that the goodness itself has its reward. So that is important to say because um, there are some misunderstandings about that often, even among Thai people. Yes. So a karma must always ripen sooner or later. It cannot be fled from. So, but it can be diluted sometimes. Uh, when we do a lot of good, the things that we've done wrong in the past can have less effect, but it will still have an effect. We can never flee from a karma. What is the law of karma not? Sometimes I say karma with double M, sometimes RM. It's the same word. It's not blaming everything on your past karma. It's not blaming everything on God's will. And it's not blaming things on destiny. Karma always gives us the opportunity to change. So it's, not, it's never fixed everything. In, in Buddhism, at least, we do not believe that there's such a thing as completely fixed destiny. There's just a, some things that are more fixed than others. Just like you have a river, and the river will sometimes go to the left, sometimes go to the right, but it will, at a certain point, go to the ocean. Some things are fixed, but some things are not. And so some people understand, misunderstand that. That's why it's important to, to think about it. Uh, I know this is, uh, I think this is a very, uh, a bit of a cynical comic, <laughs> but uh, it's important uh, to, to think about that, you know. Karma is not the thing I can do bad things to people all day and I assume they deserve it. Some people do misunderstand karma in exactly that way. I've, I've actually seen it. People think like that. So let's talk about karma in science. And I think this is actually the favorite topic of some of you. Sorry. The favorite topic of some of you. This was actually already in the presentation from, uh, from a long time ago. Uh, but you have already uh, uh, asked me about this and uh, you've uh, given your opinion about it. 
So do you remember uh, the thing we talked about is that everything in life we do, we think that affects how we act, how we do things in life. Um, I mean that um, the very rea the way, way we think already affects the reality around us. So the, even in quantum physics, there is the basic idea that the very act of observing will affect how we observe, uh, will, will affect the reality that we observe. And that uh, once we have observed something, then the, the other things can no longer happen. There will be one thing happening. But once we haven't observed something yet, then there's still more than one option. This is quantum physics um, for dummies. And uh, that's all I can talk about it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to learn that even in science, it's admitted that there is some sort of connection between the act of observing and reality itself, which shows that um, in Buddhism, according to Buddhism, that is, has to do with the fact that our mind can affect reality even though that's not the way that quantum phys physics would say it, but that is uh, what is actually the first proverb in a book of Buddhist proverbs, which is very well known. It's called the Dhammapada. The very first thing which, which it says in, in the Dhammapada is that uh, the mind precedes everything. Everything that happens is preceded by the mind. And when the mind is uh, motivated by greed, hatred, or delusion, then bad things or suffering will come into your life. And the opposite, if your mind is uh, motivated by good things, by wisdom, by generosity, or simply as the text says, directed in the right way, then uh, good things will happen. Just as the text says, just like a shadow will always follow you. Shadow, having a positive meaning in this context. You can imagine that in ancient India, <laughs> a shadow was a good thing. <laughs> it was very hot. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so it's important that uh, we realize that when we study about the law of karma, it's not just a fairy tale, but it's actually a real reality. And uh, well, in Buddhism, we never say you have to believe something. That's a very good thing about Buddhism, which I've always liked very much. We never say you have to believe some, there are no articles of faith in Buddhism that you have to believe. And if you don't believe them, you are, you are a sinner or something like that. But it's, 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 it's considered that many of these things that I talk about today are things that we should learn about. We should study, we should be open for it. There are many times when certain students of the Buddha admitted to him that they did not believe in the afterlife but they gave it the benefit of the doubt and the Buddha was uh, completely okay with that. And so this is uh, uh, an example of the way we look in Buddhism at those things. We, we do not know always everything. There's a lot we don't know. That's actually <clears throat> the, one of the very definitions of religion. It's about things we do not know for sure. <laughs> um, but just because we do not know for sure, we can explore it and we can give it some benefit of the doubt. And that is also where faith come in, in the sense that when we observe the way we live our lives and the way it has consequences, <clears throat> then we can also see how it actually uh, changes our life, how we change this, the circumstances around us and how the circumstances come back to us in a good way. And then we have faith because of that. Okay, any questions at this uh, time? We mostly covered, I think I, su I just summarized, I just reviewed <laughs> about three months of teaching. 